but Emily and I are excited to uh, let you guys know about uh, what we've been doing in N3C and specifically our work with long COVID. So as a background, N3C, uh, National COVID Cohort Collaborative, uh, is a centralized row level database. Um, and we have currently, as of the last snapshot, uh, data from 67 different sites. Uh, these are all US sites, um, which gives us access to the histories back to 2018 of 9 uh, million patients, including 3 million of which, so approximately one third of our patients are COVID positive, thanks to our two to one match. And uh, some, some prior literature from us, uh, we have one published study that is the uh, characterization of the adult population available in N3C, which is currently available, as well as a uh, characterization of the pediatric cohort in our group, which um, you can find on MedArchive at the moment. Uh, how the data gets to N3C. Uh, hey, comes... hey, Richard, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt you, but I don't see the slides moving. I don't know if that's me or if they're not moving for others. I see. I'm seeing the title slide as well. Let's try again. Do you see this? Yes, OK. I think you're good now. All right. Uh, well, this the previous slides were just numbers, so hopefully you heard some of those numbers. But anyway, the, the pipeline for our data ingest, uh, sites can send N3C data from a number of different uh, common data models, uh, including ACT uh, and OMOP, which have been mentioned previously. And uh, through a bunch of quality control efforts, uh, we have this, this virtuous cycle where we receive data from sites, we do quality reviews, we get feedback to the sites to hopefully improve uh, the data at their own um, repositories, as well as the data that's coming uh, to N3C. Working with the sites, we get data corrected uh, until the data is ingested and finally released on a weekly basis for analytics to the rest of the N3C community. Uh, I should note that the phenotypes that Emily developed uh, are open source, and these are the scripts that we let the sites run to pull out and extract um, the correct subset of COVID positive patients and, and uh, COVID negative controls uh, in the native uh, format that sites might use. And so for the rest of the talk, um, Emily is going to talk about uh, a recent publication that we have about who has long COVID. And you can see that this is, again, a massive effort, um, but Emily has really driven this study. And this is currently available um, on MedArchive. There's a bit.ly link, ehr-long-covid, uh, and it's currently under review. Thanks, Richard. Um, so yeah, there's a lot we could say about N3C, and, and it's such a rich research resource. Um, but kind of, it, it's actually very nice to follow on uh, Sean and Jeff's talk, because what we are really focusing on right now, focusing a lot of our energy on is long COVID. And, um, you know, as isn't surprising, uh, especially following the prior talk, long COVID is difficult to phenotype in many ways, much, much more difficult to phenotype than COVID itself. Um, there's many reasons for that, some of which are here on the slide. The signs and symptoms are extremely heterogeneous. Um, and then many of those signs and symptoms are maybe not even things that you would talk to your doctor about um, or think to specify in a way that would be coded in the EHR. So that of course makes things very challenging. Um, there's a lot of variation in care seeking behavior. So maybe you feel really cruddy six months after COVID, but you don't think that it's something your doctor can help with because you're aware that there really isn't a treatment for long COVID. So we may have a lot of patients who just aren't seeking healthcare for long COVID, which makes them difficult or impossible to find. Um, and then of course, the variation in the timing and the nature of COVID testing itself. Um, so very early in the pandemic, very difficult to even get a COVID test, to have a positive COVID test that they, you could then use later to say, I had a positive COVID test in March of 2020. I'm still feeling cruddy in March of 2021. Um, you may not have that test because of how difficult it was to get one. So this is a very complicated population. Um, when we are looking in N3C for potential long COVID patients, um, we are looking in a particular window of time. 
Um, it, this is the one of the interesting things about having such a large EHR repository is that we have so many patients to, uh, to choose from in terms of doing this research, but there are certain populations, uh, subpopulations rather, that are enriched for the type of data that we need. And in this case, we made sure to look for folks who did have uh, confirmed COVID. Uh, so so we, we are aware that they had a positive COVID test or a COVID diagnosis in the ED or an inpatient visit. And that it's been at least 90 days since that acute COVID period to make sure that we're looking at long COVID and not acute COVID. Um, and then we also set look back periods and look ahead periods where we're able to gather data for this group of patients um, in order to you know, evaluate their patterns of care and patterns of diagnoses and patterns of medications to maybe assess whether they could possibly have long COVID. Now, in order to do this, we chose a machine learning approach and we were fortunate that three NCC and three C sites um, uh, provided training data. Um, and those, those three sites, um, and yeah, so this slide is showing that we had training data from patients who visited the long COVID specialty clinics at their site, which is the left two columns in this table that you're looking at. Um, and that those patients who were either hospitalized with acute COVID or not hospitalized with acute COVID uh, ended up at the long COVID clinic at some point after their acute infection. And those were the patients that we chose to use as a proxy for, for long COVID. Now we know that not every single one of those patients ultimately will be a long COVID case, but in the absence of any other definition, we felt that they would be a, an extremely effective proxy while we're still working out the official phenotype. At those same three sites, we looked at patients that did not end up at the long COVID clinic and attempted to differentiate them. And um, we used this set of patients to train and test the machine learning model uh, to evaluate, again, patterns in diagnoses and medications for these patients to determine which of those features are possibly indicative of long COVID. Next slide. Um, so we ended up building three different models. Um, we felt that the patients who were hospitalized with acute COVID and not hospitalized with acute COVID were different enough to demand separate models. And um, I still am glad that we, we ended up doing it that way. Although we did build a model that includes everybody, our all patients model, which is all the way on the right side here. Um, the large sample size in N3C uh, was a, really a, a wonderful resource to use for this kind of work. And as you can see, our models performed relatively robustly. Um, the hospitalized model in particular performed quite well because as, as those of you who work a lot with EHR data know, there is often much more data available for patients who are hospitalized and therefore a lot more for the machine learning model to grab onto. Next slide. Um, this is uh, a, a, a uh, showcase of the different features that ended up being the most important in each of our models. And certainly I will not go through all of these, but I will point out some highlights in that we unsurprisingly, uh, particularly because uh, many long COVID clinics are pulmonary focused, we found that uh, dyspnea or difficulty breathing ended up at very near the top of uh, each of our models. Um, we interestingly found that COVID vaccine post-acute COVID, so not vaccine and not ever having COVID is not what I'm talking about. It's patients who had COVID and then got vaccinated do appear, at least in this model, to be less likely to end up in the long COVID clinic. Um, for hospitalized patients, patients who receive dexamethasone appear to be much less likely to end up with long COVID. And there are many other features uh, which, which you can see in detail. Um, in fact, our preprint has the top 50 features in each model, um, many of which you know, aren't necessarily as easily explainable as others, but some of which, uh, many of which rather, fit very nicely into many of the uh, features that we have seen talked about uh, regarding long COVID over the past few months. Next slide. Emily, this is a two minute warning. Okay, thanks, perfect. Um, so what we did once we trained the model is we then ran the model on everybody in N3C, not just those three sites that, uh, that met our very loose baseline criteria in that they had COVID and they were at least 90 days out from COVID. And we use this as uh, almost a toy example that we plan on refining uh, as, as the weeks go on uh, as part of the recover initiative to determine how many potential long COVID patients we may have in our data set. 
And so as you can see uh, on 846,981 patients that we ran this model on, um, our model with a 45% threshold for predicted probability ends up with about 100,000 patients being labeled as potential long COVID. Next slide. Um, so our takeaways is that we do think that a machine learning approach is uh, very effective at potentially classifying long COVID. And we would like to see this kind of method used as a recruitment tool for various uh, long COVID trials, particularly the recovery initiative. Um, we also, one, one feature I didn't point out that uh, was very important in all of the models was the level of healthcare utilization in between your acute COVID infection and when you started feeling cruddy from long COVID. Patients who utilize the healthcare system more seem to be more likely to end up in a long COVID clinic. Um, as I mentioned, the hospitalized and not hospitalized patients are different enough to justify different models. Um, but we know that many long COVID features are not well recorded in the EHR and therefore do not feature in these models. So you will not see brain fog in our list of features, not because it's not important, but because it's not coded. Um, finally, uh, we, we certainly had some terminological issues in that the way things are coded in the EHR often make things challenging to um, classify uh, diagnoses and medications into nice categories for use in machine learning. And then finally, we recognize that our future work absolutely needs to account for race, ethnicity, and area level indicators as those are important factors dictating who receives healthcare and for what. So that's all we've got today. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Um, does anyone wanna raise their hand and ask a question? Okay, there's, Emily and Richard. Oh, sorry, go ahead. There's a question in the Q&A. Ah, okay. So Bruce Aaron is asking, um, reduced risk of long COVID in DEX-treated patients is extremely interesting. Any extra resolution about when and how long DEX was given and dosing and other correlated phenotypic slash lab measures? So yeah, I agree that that's very interesting. And there are some other patterns that we view as interesting as well. We have not looked into things at the level of specificity that you're talking about there. But one thing that um, I should note is that we view this work as sort of a kickoff for um, hypothesis testing and lots of other work that could come from this. So I absolutely encourage investigation of that further. And we think we have the data to answer that specific question um, and others like it. Yeah, that would make a great N3C study. So put in a data yep. use request. <laughs> um, and then I see one other question. What type of oscillation in the top factors was visible as your study proceeded? I'm not sure I quite understand what's meant by oscillation. I, I would add that I, I don't think we um, study different time periods. Uh, okay. But we do have the, the real time-stamped dates of the encounter. So we could do an analysis where we broke it down by different waves. Right, thank you. Yep, that's right. Uh, how does this machine learning driven long COVID condition definition compare to recent WHO long COVID consensus? Yeah, we, uh, we referenced the WHO definition uh, quite carefully when we were doing this work. And actually it came out the day we were ready to submit our manuscript, <laughs> which was interesting and we, um, we did a comparison and saw quite a bit of overlap. We also saw, however, that the WHO definition includes a lot of those um, nebulous things that aren't often coded in the EHR, things that just would maybe end up in a, in a note, which speaks to the importance of future natural language processing, or things that would really only come out if you were specifically interviewing a patient about their long COVID. Um, and so I think that what this speaks to for me is that there really probably isn't one path to, to correctly define long COVID patients, that it's really important to be able to account for patient reported data, survey data, EHR data, and then together through all of those different angles, we'll come up with the best definition. Great. Emily, Richard, thank you both so much for joining us uh, very last minute. We greatly appreciate it.